Hello and welcome back to another brilliant edition of Bossing English with Mr F on Macbeth. Um, today we're going to be looking at soliloquies uh, and why there are so many of them in this play, what they do. You might get one of these as an extract and how would you go about um, kind of attacking that in terms of analysis. What is a soliloquy? Well, I would always want to consider the dramatic effect. And the number one dramatic effect of a soliloquy is characterization, because what do soliloquies allow us to see as an audience? Uh, it allows us uh, an intimate connection with the protagonist or the character. Our protagonist is Macbeth, the play is named after him, the tragedy of Macbeth. Uh, and what it really allows is uh, it makes thought visible. It makes thought visible and audible for the audience. So rather than just having a character performing actions that we might not understand, especially if they're violent or, you know, regicidal, murderous, uh, tyrannical actions, by allowing us um, access to the thought processes behind them, that character suddenly becomes more psychologically uh, realistic, uh, and maybe we understand um, more of his motives. Uh, we see the fact that these aren't easy decisions to make, that there's a lot of back and forth in terms of pros and cons or moral argumentation justifying it. So what we have is someone who, you know, I guess these murders are premeditated and we see the meditations upon those murders at these moments of uh, soliloquy where uh, we get to understand the why, uh, you know, or we get to understand that it wasn't just an instinctive uh, and thoughtless murder, but actually something that was deeply considered. Macbeth was written after Hamlet. Hamlet is stuffed full of uh, soliloquies, and Hamlet himself is very famous for being uh, maybe seen as indecisive because he spends so much time thinking, uh, you know, which we're party to as an audience through the soliloquies. So that came first um, as a play uh, not so long ago, I think it's 1599 or 1601, I can't remember offhand, um, but this is 1606, 1605, 1606, so it's after that. So, you know, Shakespeare, if we want to bring in some context, had form of having a leading character, a protagonist, a tragic hero, who allows us as an audience to witness the thought processes behind his actions. And Macbeth, as a hero, tragic hero, has far more airtime or stage time as a soliloquy uh, saying character than Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth has maybe one or two. <coughs> the one after reading the letter, which I've looked at in an earlier video. And then this one where she seems to align herself with uh, the evil spirits and often people might think of her as the fourth witch there's an argument that could be made there using evidence from this soliloquy <coughs> and maybe if we think about a kind of inbuilt imbalance in terms of gender for this play it's just that lady macbeth and women in general have less stage time and presence than the men um, and when they do how are they being portrayed lady macbeth here appears someone you know kind of dark maybe even satanic um, and, you know, understanding of what's required to commit evil acts in terms of uh, the cloak of night so that God can't see the evil that she's doing. But even then, we could argue that that is suggesting that she has, um, you know, an awareness that this is, um, you know, a sin uh, that's being committed. Always we could link this recognition of the sin to the great chain of being, uh, divine right of kings, uh, and, you know, the understanding that only God gets to appoint the king, you can't <coughs> take a shortcut. <coughs> and um, that's, um, you know, that's something you, you'd want to link to there. But I think what's more interesting in terms of characterization is she's aware of that. So she's then not just a heartless, thoughtless killer, but someone who's trying to cover her tracks, uh, you know, before the divine, aware of the judgment that awaits her, uh, you know, afterlife, in the afterlife. Um, again, always look for structural features. You might, if you're giving this as an extract, what you want to do is think about beginnings and endings, you know, the symbolism of the raven, maybe a harbinger of death, 
uh, croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan, so kind of foreshadowing uh, what's coming. Uh, we could explore that, and then by the end, we get this kind of dramatic uh, voice of God, uh, you know, that she hears in her head. And again, you could go back to what I just said earlier about linking that to an awareness. Now, any other structural features? Yes, there are. Look at this. Come, you spirits, and sex me here. Come to my woman's breast. Come thick night. So this commanding language, the imperative there, is used three times, and there are kind of three sections to it, and you could explore if there's any kind of development or change in direction in those sections. So there, um, again, look for big, obvious things. Again, the use of you. So it's, this is like an address, isn't it? <coughs> and almost like an incantation or a spell that we've seen with Hecate and the witches as well. I can have a sip of tea because my... Uh... Mm, that's better. All right, what else about these? Well, Macbeth prevaricates deliberates a lot before uh, killing Duncan. Look here in 1.7 and then 2.1 immediately before and then only then at this exit does he go away and do it. So this is someone who spent a lot of time thinking about it and actually you'll remember here we'll proceed no further in this business. He talks himself out of doing it and then gets talked back into doing it uh, and then has this kind of supernatural vision of a dagger. We'll proceed no further in this business so again which Macbeth is this is this the kind of is this where he becomes a tragic hero he, he he's lacks the will to stand up to his wife uh between 1.7 when she persuades him and, and you know degrades his manhood uh in order to uh, get him to act um maybe that's we could we could explore that as well um, and then within these speeches, I mean, this one's quite interesting because we just get a list of pros and cons, don't we? Uh, all the reasons not to, and he leads with that. So again, if I was making a structural point, um, he's here in double trust. First, we get this kind of sense of a list besides, uh, you know, pointing out another reason. Uh, double trust, his host, I should, you know, not bear the night again. And then the deep damnation of his taking off, how everyone will react. Uh, I have, And then the only thing, I have no spur but only vaulting ambition. So the only thing, and that's where Lady Macbeth, you know, is required to act. So there's more reasons against than for, um, uh, if I just do that like that. And I think structurally that's quite interesting, isn't it, against for, and again, he leads with an understanding of uh, the, the punishment that he will uh, face, you know, the sin that he's about to commit with regicide. And again, you can link that to the great chain of being. Uh, interestingly, I'm just gonna skip forward here. This is what um, haunts uh, the, you know, when he's plotting, uh, becoming paranoid and plotting uh, Banquo's downfall. For Banquo's issue, have I filed my mind? This is because he can't sleep. Uh, so his mind is full of kind of toxic poisons, keeping him awake, nightmares. Uh, he understands that he's killed someone who is loved by God, gracious, linked to grace, the Christian concept. Put rancors in the vessel of my peace uh, and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man. Now, I think this is like talking about paradise. So he's basically saying, I will go to hell, not heaven. So we can see this idea of the sin of the regicide haunts him. He, 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 he begins this soliloquy being aware of what punishment awaits and talks himself out of it. Um, but here he's still haunted by that. Uh, what about this one? Um, if you were to get this one, well, again, big obvious things. Question, question, question. Right, so it leads with rhetorical questions, right? Uh, a series of rhetorical questions. Who are they questions to? Himself? Uh, the audience? You know, wh what are they doing there? What's the dramatic purpose of those questions? Is he doubting his eyes, his senses? Uh, you know, who's he interrogating with those questions? Is he interrogating, you know, fate, evil? Um, again, and, and there's a kind of back and forth here. Um, I see the, uh, the other great thing about this one is that it's a conversation with uh, the, the, the uh, thou. You'd have to attack that, that kind of conversational aspect. Um, so is the conversation with the dagger or with uh, you know the witches if he thinks that they're the ones leading him astray um, 
thou marshallest me, uh, the way I was going. So I think you've got that conversational aspect, the kind of interrogational aspect with the rhetorical questions, which may be directed at himself or his morality or um, the witches, if he thinks that they're the ones behind that. And then there's no such thing. Again, he kind of received kind of glimpses of, uh, you know, a kind of rationality appearing in here. In, in, you know, so there's like this battle between the rational and the irrational. Maybe that's one way of exploring this. However, the irrational and the supernatural uh, occupies the, the second half of this. Um, and he seems to align himself with the supernatural world because it's at night and maybe he's already aligned himself with the influence of the witches. He bears a charmed life. He seems to be under their spell with the way he speaks. We talked about that in an earlier video. Um, and again, he understands that he's in danger of talking himself out of this. While well, I threat, he lives words to the heat of deeds. This is really significant. Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. I, it's a way of saying that the more I talk, the less likely I am to go through with it. And we've already seen him do that in an earlier soliloquy. So he doesn't want that to happen again if he doesn't want to upset his wife. Um, so you could explore some of the imagery here. Uh, Hecate, who features in the play, some of this kind of imagery about ghosts and wolves and murder, which gets personified. Um, and then finally, the bell, which is a kind of symbolic interruption of the speech. And obviously bells are linked to death. Um, the idea of John Donne, you know, do not ask who the bell rings for, it rings for thee. I go and it is done, the bell invites me. So this is kind of his, uh, what is supposed to be his wife signalling that it's all clear. And then the sense of the knell and hell, the rhyming couplet to kind of uh, add a sense of closure to the uh, life or death uh, situation he finds himself in. Right, there we are. A few thoughts about soliloquies in uh, Macbeth and in Shakespeare in general. Bye for now.